priming. And <coughs> although we can't probe individual neurons in the human brain, so we haven't actually discovered these mirror neurons in the human brain, the assumption is that they're there based on imaging studies that show that the human brain in a similar way mirrors uh, behavioral goals, uh, actions with uh, uh, intentional goals, and there's a really a wide range of studies showing mirroring, not only through observation, but actually through hearing words and sentences of actions. So if you think about reading a novel, as well as uh, emotions and sensations and so on. So mirror neurons don't prove, of course, the mimetic theory. They don't, in fact, actually even explain the whole of imitation which we still don't completely know how imitation actually happens in terms of a complete neural architecture. What they do show is what's unique about this discovery is that there is this fundamental neural wiring that allows uh, a cross-modal matching between observation and execution of the same action. So it's a piece of the puzzle, not the whole explanation of, of any of this. I won't, I'll sort of skip through the social psychology experiments, but the main gist of this very powerful quote that says, overt imitation is just the disinhibited tip of the iceberg of continual covert imitation. So children imitate openly. Uh, through development, they learn to inhibit their immediate tendency to imitate. It becomes more representation in terms of thinking. But actually, a lot of experiments show that there's continuous, ongoing, pervasive social imitation in ways that we're fundamentally not aware of. And in fact, in experiments designed to get others to imitate, the adults will deny that they actually ever were, even though the experiments clearly show that they were in, in fundamental ways. So the separation between self and other is very thin. and. Um, there's a lot of what they call covert imitation happening, even though it's not exhibited in overt imitation. Okay, so, however. Scott. Yeah. If you can wrap it in five minutes, okay. Five minutes? Yeah. Okay, okay. Can you five do that? Or seven? S seven minutes will be good. <laughs> Let <Okay>. me. <laughs> this quote? <coughs> this is a sort of summary quote from Trevartan. He says, the facts are that motives in individuals do affect the awareness and intentions motivated in other individuals. The understanding and misunderstanding of talk and of all symbolic and representational forms of language are carried upon intuitive interpersonal regulations and upon mimetic representations that cross intersubjective space easily. They are woven into narratives of sympathetic intentionality charged with emotion. The main point here is that everything we do isn't necessarily imitation, but everything we do relationally has some mimetic underlying component to it. So it's the same thing with mirror neurons. Even though we're not imitating overtly over all the time, there is this very immediate experiential uh, process of mirroring or, or uh, doing as if we're doing, even though it doesn't get translated into overt actual copying or mimicking. So there's this pervasive ongoing uh, mimesis taking place. However, and this is where imitation actually starts to get even more interesting, believe it or not, according to Girard, the same mimetic capacities are also involved in competitive behavior, leading to intense and unique forms of human relational conflict and violence. Girard says, in 1979, if you survey the literature on imitation, you will quickly discover that acquisition and appropriation, appropriation is to get something completely for yourself, just for yourself, are never included among the modes of behavior that are likely to be imitated. If acquisition and appropriation were included, imitation as a social phenomenon would turn out to be more problematic than it appears and above all, conflictual. Here's his understanding, here's the starting point for harmonization for Girard. He says that cause, the cause of conflict through imitation, is rivalry provoked by an object. The acquisitive mimesis, which must always be our point of departure. We will see now that not only the, the prohibition 
but also ritual and ultimately the whole structure of religion can be traced back to the mechanism of acquisitive mimesis. A complete theory of human culture will be elaborated beginning with this single principle. So this is what I'm gonna do in about three minutes, take you from <laughs> acquisitive mimesis to collective violence, okay? How does this begin? Well, you remember the joint attentional activities, and I could say more about this, how profound they are and unique they are in, in human relationships from the developmental research. Not only does it bring us to share things together, but as we know in childhood, it leads to the most intense sibling rivalry, right? Over an object that, that children want fundamentally because the other child wants it and they go back and forth, and, and it's as if they'll die if they don't get that thing, right? And as parents, you know how that is. You walk into a store, a child wants something. It's as if they'll die if they don't get the thing that they know their friend has, right? But if you buy it, take it home, suddenly, after a while, they're no longer interested in it. That desire for the thing, once you get it, is lost because the desire for Gerard is fundamentally in that process of imitating. So this leads to what Girard calls mimetic desire, which is the first sort of unique stage of human desire, where things really take on profound significance because of that reciprocating feedback loop between individuals based on our capacity for joint attention and our uh, ability to imitate uh, desires. This leads to mimetic rivalry. What's unique about mimetic rivalry is that you get into this intense argument back and forth, people become mirrors of one another. They soon forget what they were even fighting about. The whole goal becomes to uh, prove themselves or beat their rival, prove themselves over the rival, when ironically, they're, they're showing themselves to be exactly the same. Going through this really fast. This leads to mimetic violence once the rivalry intensifies so much, somebody strikes out with a blow Pretty soon, all those physiological systems that are aroused, uh, violence can be one of the most imitative acts of human behavior. And this picture, I like this picture because it shows how the two people fundamentally become blurred or undifferentiated. And the more they fight, the more they're, they're attempting to show themselves to be so much different from the other. And really conquering your rival is the only way to really show that, even though you're fundamentally the same. In early proto-human cultures, these rivalries would have been very much felt by the, the small the social networks that would have spread to other individuals, leading to what Girard calls the mimetic crisis, the war of all against all, where everybody's against everybody. You don't know who's on your side, where it, where it started. And this is a very fundamental sort of psychology of, of a collective chaos. At some point, <coughs> these individuals who are desperately seeking differentiation, some resolution to this chaos, invariably find somebody who gets singled out and mimetically, imitatively, those, that person who's singled out becomes the focus, collective focus of joint attention at the powerful level of, of group, the group level. You get this mob mentality where the mob demands some victim resolution and ultimately it's resolved in collective violence. Each of these stages, according to Girard, are unique. Collective violence at this level is unique to humans. And if you think about the power of joint attention in, in childhood, and if you think about the power of joint attention that gets resolved through a victim, and especially at a level before this is, you know, early, early human culture, this event is unprecedented. And this event takes on fundamental significance that ultimately becomes ritualized and is the basis for Girard's understanding of how a behavior like this could be evolutionary, very adaptive to human life and human culture. And I'm sure this will be elaborated on throughout this uh, seminar. So I'll stop there. Thank you.